Let's talk about uh, let's talk about fear. This uh, to the topics today are apocalypse, change, finances, and the fear of missing out. And I know you're thinking, like I was, what in the world do these things have to do with each other? Well, I'm going to jump in first to apocalypse, and we'll see if we can find the the thread that goes through. Back in 2014, I'm guessing that you missed a really awful movie. Uh, and that was the much-touted reboot of the Left Behind series. Did anybody see that in theaters? One person in the back. Okay, was it as bad as I, as I have heard it is? All right. He, and he's brave enough to admit that he saw it. Yeah, so Left Behind was the 12-volume series uh, by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins that portrayed the last days of the earth. And this was, the book series began in 1995 and continued on for several years from there. And back when the books were first published, this was somewhat of a, a craze among Christians. I don't know of any church library that does not have a full set of these books. Does our library have them? Where, I don't know where Elizabeth went. She, she would know. Well, we, we have pretty good curriculum standards. Maybe it doesn't. But uh, <laughs> the, this film, the, this film tanked. Despite having 16, a $16 million budget and Nicolas Cage as the lead actor, it tanked. On IMDb, which is a, a movie uh, database website, the movie is ranked number 30 on the worst rated movies of all time. <laughs> Just two steps down from the Emoji movie and two steps up from that 1996 gem starring Shaq, Kazam. So uh, <laughs> you add that to your weekend viewing list next week. On Rotten Tomatoes, a popular uh, critic website, this film earned just 1% positive reviews. I particularly love this review. Yea, verily like unto a plague of locusts, left behind hath begat a further scourge of devastation upon Nicolas Cage's once problem. <laughs> or another reviewer said, uh, picking up on the irony of the subject matter, he said, I can't wait for Nick Cage to explain this one to God on Judgment Day. <laughs> and this one is definitely to the point. Left Behind is being marketed as Christian entertainment, but it does not qualify in either category. <laughs> so, all right, so I'm bashing Left Behind. Yeah. From, a, from a Christian perspective, the, the problem with Left Behind is that it actually distracts us from what the Bible really says about the end. And it draws our attention to things that even if they do withstand theological scrutiny, and I'll share in just a minute, that's a big if, it, they, it's, to put it uh, biblically, it's dwelling on, uh, dwelling on these details is like trying to strain out a gnat while swallowing a camel. Of course, Left Behind isn't the only apocalyptic dystopian film or, or book series that's really been popular. Uh, maybe you saw or read The Hunger Games years ago. That was a really popular and, uh, and, and uh, compelling series. One of my favorites recently is the Wool series by Hugh Howard, uh, which actually is set in post-apocalyptic Georgia. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting series. But the, the end times are big business. And one of the reasons it's big business is because of fear. All of these things uh, they tap into our most base and, and foundational fears about the future. The future is uncertain. We don't have a roadmap about, uh, a perfect roadmap of, of exactly what the future looks like. And so anything that purports to give us insight, to give us a glimpse, it captures our attention. And all that uncertainty breeds Fear. Politicians, the news media, corporations, they know how to tap into this fear to their own ends. Is the power grid going to collapse and cause a zombie apocalypse when your grandmother forgets to unplug the toaster oven? Find out more at 10 o'clock. You know, that's the kind of teasers we hear on the news. It's tapping in to fear. Remember Y2K? A lot of people thought that the world was just going to end at midnight on the year 2000 is, you know, and, and not only was the computer in your office going to turn into a glorified uh, boat anchor, but also airplanes are going to fall from the sky, the stock market would crash, ATMs would just start spitting out cash, and the, the banking system would disintegrate, and the internet was going to grind to a halt. And there were plenty of well-meaning believers, Christians, who were saying, Jesus is going to come back. 
at midnight on January 1st, 2000. I turned 21 on November 15, 1999. So guess what I was doing on January 1, 2000? Yeah, Tudor's Corner in Auburn. It was an amazing party. And I remember in between these sips of whatever awful hooch I was drinking, I remember thinking, what if Jesus comes back and finds me doing this? And I was, you know, I was naive at that age. Um, but part of me worried that, that it was going to happen. And, and Jesus didn't come back, or at least I don't think he did. Maybe he did, and we're all in the end times. And this just hellscape that we're living in is just part of the reality. Now, but you know, we, we tuned into those stories of Y2K. We bought into the frenzy, I think, because we're all just at least a little afraid of the future. And some people literally buy into it. They buy guns. They buy bunkers. They stockpile food. And this is an area where fear can lead us to so many irrational and unhelpful pursuits. It's also one of those places where fear can be a gift. I mean, you know, some computer programs did need to be rewritten. We do need to save money. Um, the, the, those are the sort of things that, that a, a healthy fear of the future, if, if, if that motivates us to do those things, then so much the better. But in the same way, the specter of melting ice caps, flooded coastlines, the possibility of mutual annihilation by nuclear powers, that ought to spark a little fear in us and maybe motivate us to act and, and, and change what seems sometimes to be this inevitable future of destruction. But the question of what to do with our fear of the future hinges on faith. You may remember this acronym uh, that Adam Hamilton talked about in the book that Lori highlighted last week. Fear can be uh, summarized. Face your fears with faith. Examine your assumptions in light of facts. Attack your anxieties with action and release your cares to God. So I think one of the biggest issues for Christians when it comes to the end is right here, our assumptions about the end. Because of the popularity of all of that dystopian literature, including Left Behind, our assumptions about the end are often shaped more by those other literature genres than they are what the Bible actually says. So this series and similar ideas have shaped our imagination about the future in profound ways. And these are ways that frankly are not very biblical. So let's talk for a minute about these assumptions about the end. Now the end is a pretty significant concern of the Bible. The, the, the end is one of the most frequent subjects in the Bible. And, but left behind, along with numerous other end times fads, have tended to hijack our focus away from the Bible's core claims about the end to focus more on those eschatological gnats. That word eschatology means talk about the end. And as I suggested, the Bible talks a lot about the end. Because when we're talking about the end, we're talking about the fulfillment of God's purposes. So eschatology, the study of the end, all those things having to do with the end, and the culmination of God's salvation, that is a big deal in the Bible. But whereas doomsday prophets have long tried to decipher what they see as all these coded messages in the Bible and make predictions as to when and how certain eschatological things will shake down, the Bible's almost singular focus when it's talking about the end is how we ought to live in the present in light of the end. So let me spend a few minutes on the sometimes scary subject of the central theme in Left Behind, that is the rapture. I suspect that for some of you, what I'm going to say is going to challenge what you have come to believe, and that's okay. The father of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, said we can disagree about the gnats. We can disagree about those little things, those minor things. So this, in the end, may be a minor issue, and it, it may be okay to disagree. But the rapture is this idea that at some point in the last days, the faithful church 
will be taken up to heaven, leaving sinners and, and ne'er-do-wells behind on earth to endure this period of, of literally hell on earth. Um, in the Left Behind series, when the, the, the rapture is depicted, it, it's shown that suddenly planes fall to the earth because the pilots are raptured, that driverless cars careen out of control, great fear and confusion ensue, which would no doubt be the result if all of the world's Christians suddenly vanished. The idea around the rapture, though, was first promoted by a man named John Nelson Darby, not back in the time of Jesus, but in 1800s. Um, Darby was born in, in 1800 to, in England to an Irish family. He became an Irish priest. Uh, he left the priesthood because of some theological differences and political differences with the church. But then in the 1830s, he began to meet with a few other believers who shared his distinctive views, and they founded a group called the Plymouth Brethren. Now, Brethren theology was within a stream called dispensationalism. It's a way of looking at history as a series of distinct periods or dispensations. So the first dispensation was the period of the creation, and then there was the fall, and then there was... Uh, the time of Abraham, and then there was the time of Moses and the law, and so on. And so the last dispensation is the period in which Christ rules for all eternity. Now, Darby's distinctive twist on dispensationalism was that Jesus would not return just once, as Christians always had believed that he would, but he would return twice. And his first second coming would be to snatch all faithful Christians up with him to heaven so that they would not have to endure that apocalyptic hellscape that would follow uh, the rapture. And Darby and the other brethren searched the scriptures for clues and signs to construct this elaborately detailed timeline of how they believed this would occur. And his framework gained traction in part because it purported to provide answers, clear answers, Definitive answers to the kind of future that theologians and biblical scholars for centuries before that had left shrouded in mystery. And in fact, the Bible had left shrouded in mystery. It also gained traction thanks to some accents of history. In the mid-1800s, Darby made several visits to the United States, which if you remember your history, in the middle of the 1800s was embroiled in a very nasty civil war. So Darby visited during that time and began to tout his, uh, his unique take on Christ's return. And the Americans who were going through that terrifying ordeal began to, to really latch on to that. I mean, the, one of the things Jesus says in the Gospels, he says, do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. And this was exactly what seemed to be unfolding in the middle of the Civil War. And so Christians at that time were really latching on to this idea that maybe they could get to escape it. Wouldn't you want to escape that kind of hell on earth? And so Darby's framework of the end time suggested that there was worse yet to come. But praise be to God that Jesus wouldn't let his believers, his faithful, have to endure that. He was going to come and rapture the church. And this became enough, this, this theme only intensified during the 20th century with World War I and World War II and the Cold War and Vietnam and the destabilization of the Middle East and all the seismic revolutions in, in culture in the 1960s. And so in the midst of all this, other evangelists took up Darby's system and set many American Christians on permanent rapture watch. So that's a, that's a brief summary of the rapture from 1800 to 2018. A couple of points in affirmation of left behind theology. First, the Bible does have some parts that suggest that the end isn't going to be all sunshine and rainbows. In fact, the events associated with the end, I mean, let's, let's face it, there are some pretty terrible dynamics to life on earth. 
There's some pretty vicious powers are, are out there that aren't just going to go quietly because Jesus and his followers say, hey, I'm the Lord. And they're not going to do that. Interestingly, the visions in, of the end in the Bible, in books like Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and the letters of Paul and the Gospels, all of them, they're written during times when believers were under intense persecution by vicious powers that you look back in history and they didn't go away with a whimper. So bringing down those powers involves some precast cataclysmic events. A second point of affirmation is that the biblical visions of the end are unanimous, unanimous in their confident hope that God will deal with those powers. In fact, when we talk about the good news of salvation, and that's what well, ostensibly we talk about all the time, right? When we talk about that, we're talking about the defeat of one of the final and most absolute powers, seemingly absolute, that there is, and that is the power of death. We claim as Christians that Jesus has already defeated that power, and that sets us free not to be afraid of that power, and therefore to live life as Christ wants us to live. And that's where Paul is going in Romans 8 when he waxes eloquent about this good news. He says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the rest of Romans is all about being faithful to that call, being faithful to the way of Christ. There is evil at work in the world. There is evil at work in our own hearts, but it will not finally thwart God's purposes for us. So those two themes are front and center in the New Testament. But against left behind, they are not present to scare the living daylights out of us. These themes of the end are not in the Bible to... Uh, to make predictions. They are front and center as an invitation, to use Paul's words, to live a life worthy of the gospel. We're invited in light of the fact that there is an end and that it is God who wins the day to accept God's grace and seek that kingdom that is coming, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the Bible's vision of the end is one of God's heavenly kingdom coming to earth, not of believers escaping to heaven. I'm going to say that again. The biblical vision of the end is of God's kingdom coming to earth, not of believers escaping to heaven. This is one of those major assumptions that we have to examine because it shapes sometimes our fears about those really scary things that we see unfolding on the world stage. God's kingdom is coming to earth. We don't need to be on the lookout for when Jesus is going to save us from whatever we're experiencing. I think when you look at the evidence in scriptures, when you look at the core tradition of the church's teaching, we can see that so much of Darby's message and other end time prophets is based on a false assumption that the world is going to hell. When the biblical message is the world is going to be redeemed. So, who can say for sure what's going to happen when the archangel's trumpet sounds? Who can say for sure that he's even going to sound a trumpet? Maybe he sends a text message or a Facebook message, which is tough because I don't use Facebook Messenger. Y'all will let me know when you, if that's how it comes. But I think left behind leaves us with false hope and ultimately causes us to neglect one of the most central works of the church. Remember, that's the third step. That we have actions that can attack our anxiety. And Christ has called us as a church to action. So that we don't have to be afraid as, as all of these things unfold in our world. For some, uh, for some of our fears about the future, those actions are intensely practical. Practical steps like making sure your computer is updated. So things like Y2K don't, don't destroy you. <laughs> Making sure that you're, uh, that you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint. Saving money. 
Those are practical steps that can help us prepare for an uncertain future. But we also have work we can do to attack our anxieties about the theological dimensions of our future. Fears about salvation and the significance of world events. You know, if we change our assumption from the world is going to hell and we're going to escape it to a more biblical assumption that God is looking for his world to be renewed with the advent of his kingdom, we might begin to take greater action in moving into his world to share that kingdom, to invite people to experience it. Instead of surrendering the world to warmongers and politicians who say that blowing each other up is the way for a future, we ought to speak into a frightened world and, and say that peacemaking and the way of love and reconciliation is what wins the day. That's the message of, of Revelation. That the, the slaughtered lamb is the one who is in, in the end worshipped. I think we could take, take on spiritual disciplines to become more like his son. We could be serious about that claim that blessed are the peacemakers. So we could be peacemakers in our own communities who prove that conflict is not destined to end in world annihilation, but might end in, in greater fellowship and community. I think we could double down on our own conviction that our church is a place of refuge for the lost, a place where the broken can be healed, a place where people who are afraid and lonely and oppressed can experience something of God's kingdom now. Now, taking on all of those things and, and, and acting on those new assumptions, <coughs> it requires that we begin to change which brings its own fear. And that's my indelicate uh, segue to the fear of change. <laughs> so Katie, will you tell us about change? <laughs> Thank you. You didn't tell me I'd be following the apocalypse. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Into preparation. Does that make sense? Um, and so that 
that can be a good way of doing it. So, and sometimes there are pros to anxiety. So maybe like you are more prepared or you can avoid some things by thinking through the possibilities, but most of the time it's not really gonna benefit you. Um, and so we wanna really replace those negative thoughts with like more positive or productive things. Um, and so I'll kind of go into that more in a second. But um, also as I was thinking about the topic of fear of change, I kind of like to distinguish so there's change that happens to you and change that you can make happen. Um, and so change that happens to you might be like a death or a natural disaster or just like something significant that happens in your life or your family's life. And change that you make happen might be like you would really like to engage in personal growth. Um, and so there's good things and hard things about either one of those. Um, change that happens to you, um, you just are kind of forced to deal with it head on. Um, change that you make happen can be a little bit more difficult to motivate yourself <coughs> and to do all the things necessary to make that change happen. And a lot of times when we are making the change happen, it can be really difficult for our relationships um, because we might feel like we're leaving people behind or we're making a lot of changes in a positive direction but other people aren't, and so they feel a little bit of guilt and shame and just confusion about that. Um, and so that can be an added difficulty that maybe we don't think about, and that's what makes it really hard to make a huge change. Um, say, like, um, becoming a Christian, starting to go to church, maybe the friendships that you had before that, they had, didn't have the same beliefs as you did, um, and so that can make those relationships really hard and make you question, like, is this worth it? Um, and then the main thing I really wanted to talk about and something that comes up a lot with clients when change is happening um, and maybe just a different perspective to offer you is that when we're talking about change, like there's always something to grieve in that. Um, and grief sounds scary and it's hard. Um, but anytime change happens, we're moving into a new season, like a new role in our life. And even if it's something really positive, like having a baby or getting married or like letting your kids move on and go to college or like start their next journey. Um, those things can be really, really positive and there's something to grieve there. Like your life is never gonna be the same that it was. Like with a baby, like you might not be able to ever see them again. But <laughs> <laughs>
have no shame in promoting Summit Counseling because that is uh, that, that's a vital ministry. And, and this church invests a lot of uh, resources and, and energy in making sure that Summit Counseling has uh, a home and that uh, we're able to receive clients uh, without uh, without that stigma uh, that, that sometimes comes with counseling. We should not be ashamed of needing help uh, because one of the, the core messages, what if, if you turn to the Psalms, for instance, Right there in the, the, the core prayer book of the Bible is this constant refrain for Lord, help, help, help. We are not islands. We need help. And that's especially true as we face uh, these big things, um, change and, and whatnot. All right. So in the book, um, Adam Hamilton goes on to talk about the fear of missing out and the fear around finances. And I, I'm going to admit when I first read that, I thought, this guy needs a better editor. These things don't fit together in this unit. Um, but they're there. Fear of missing out. Shorthand in the millennial uh, parlance is FOMO. Has anybody ever heard that before today? Uh, I had not heard it until I looked at this book. That shows you how, how to touch that I am. Um, but something I, I heard on the radio recently, it caused these things to click in my mind as to how they fit together. Um, the, uh, the, I, was, I was listening to um, Hidden Brain on NPR. And if anybody heard that podcast or seen that, or, or sometimes there's a little segment on the radio. Well, this was one of the radio segments, and uh, host Shankar Vedantam was interviewing a social psychologist, Mina Sakara, about one of our base social, uh, one of the base social realities that occurs when we interact with others. So I went and found the, the transcript to this. Um, Sikara was talking about how we make sense of the world through social comparisons. When you meet a new person, she says, there, there's a lot of things that, that go on right there in that moment. Uh, things that you register immediately, but you don't just do that in an abstract sense. You don't just say, wow, that person is uh, uh, six feet tall. Instead, you, you register that in comparison to yourself. Wow, that person is taller than me or shorter than me. So it's, it's reflective. It, it's, uh, it's relative to you. Uh, how much taller or shorter are they than I am? And we don't just do that on height. Obviously, we do it across the, across the board. So the Gotham said we do this because the comparison tells us where we fit in, what our place is in the human hierarchy. And what's more, it might alert us to imbalances in the human situation that need our attention. Now, sometimes those comparisons don't matter very much in the grand scheme of things. They don't make that big of a difference in, in what we think of ourselves or others. He gave the example of how he might look at his colleague, Steve Inskey, who is one of the hosts on NPR, and, and how not only did he Vedana might, might see, not only does he uh, host this, this morning program successfully, but he also finds time every couple of years to put out a, a, a best-selling book. And, you know, he, he said, I don't wish anything bad to happen to him. I just wish that I was more like him. <laughs> now, that's one way that we might go with that. And, and when he said that, that's when it clicked that what they were talking about and what what I think Adam Hamilton is really talking about, or what he's really getting at in this book, is envy. Envy. That's really what the fear of missing out is, and to a large degree, our struggles and, and anxieties around finances. It's not truly fear so much as it is anxiety motivated by envy. We see others, we compare ourselves to them, and we can feel inadequate by that comparison. And that raises our anxiety. And as Madonna points out, that like genuine fear, this kind of social anxiety can be motivational. It can motivate us to, to aspire to better things in life and, and, and grow ourselves. Uh, it can motivate us to pursue things that are truly good for us and enjoyable to us. As the example that Madonna himself raised, maybe he would write a book and and he would feel fulfilled, and, and, and he would be proud of that. It would help other people. That can be a helpful kind of motivation. But it can also be negative in that these comparisons can overwhelm us and defeat us if we're not able to do uh, 
uh, or to become what we witness in others. So this phenomenon of FOMO has probably always been a thing, but there have always been others against whom we compare ourselves. You can uh, imagine the, the caveman watching his buddies go off for the big hunt, but he's promised his wife he'd stay behind and, and help out with the washing the loincloths. You know, so he has a, an anxiety, a fear, a, a regret there for, for missing out. Or, or maybe that Bronze Age uh, woman who, who sees her neighbor, she already has a plow made of bronze, and, and here she is over here digging in the soil with her hands, and she has this envy of, of what her neighbor has. You feel a little envious, but recently FOMO has become a thing. So big of a thing that we need to shorten it. Fear of missing out has its own little acronym. So even 100 years ago, the only people you encountered on a regular basis were the people in your town. And by and large, you shared a common thread with all of those people, and there weren't a lot of differences in achievement or education or wealth, certainly not by today's standards. But in the last 100 years, the radio, the television, the computer, the internet, it's brought all of that right into the palm of our hands. And in the last 10 years, social media has ramped that up exponentially. In fact, there's evidence that social media elevates FOMO and financial anxiety in ways that have never before been experienced by human communities. The cavemen, those Bronze Age folks, even your grandparents didn't have to deal with this. But we do. Researcher Ohad Barzali conducted a study into the effects that Facebook has on our lives. He compared the mental well-being of people using the site against a control group of people who were prohibited from using the site. And what he found was that Facebook puts people in a mode where they engage constantly in social comparison. He said, you compare yourself to others more often. You judge yourself. You compare, am I better or worse than my friends? Am I happier? Are they happier? And so on. So if you're on, if you're on social media, you're constantly seeing these images and Maybe you remember that scripture passage where Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. You're constantly seeing these images of your friends having a great dinner at a fancy restaurant. And then you look at the own bowl of left your, your bowl of leftovers that you pulled out of the refrigerator. <laughs> and you feel somehow less than. Or you're you're single, maybe, and you, you look at your friends that uh, on these amazing vacations with their families, and your own life looks a little lonely by comparison. Or maybe if you have kids, you see your, your friend's child with the blue ribbon for winning the spelling bee, but you look at your own child and you think about her report card, the straight C's, and, and you feel like your own child may be dumb by comparison. Whether it's true or not, those are the sort of judgments you begin to make. And Barzillet says that being engaged in excessive social comparison in this way actually decreases our happiness. But it's not just a matter of increasing <coughs> happiness, it also increases our anxiety. University of Pennsylvania psychologist Barbara Kahn noted that her students would often report that, that when they would go off on these amazing experiences like a destination wedding or a an amazing vacation, that they would be unhappy while they were doing those amazing things. And the culprit, she discovered, was social media. Their Facebook feeds were telling them about all the things their friends were doing back home, and they experienced anxiety because they were missing out on those things, even though they were having these amazing experiences doing other things. So what she found through some experimentation was that the feelings of, of fear of missing out weren't really fear. It was that social anxiety. These kids were worried about what their friends were doing in building up their own social group. 
and the fear really set in when that development happened apart from them. What they were really afraid of was that they were going to be somehow carved out of that group. So the fear of missing out and that level really has to do with that need to belong. So, you know, I, I really began to experience this shortly after moving here. I had a <coughs> back in Birmingham, uh, Randall Woodfin, who became mayor of Birmingham back in November. Um, I was really excited for him. You know, Randall and I had worked together on some school board issues. Uh, we would see each other in public and we would speak. We weren't friends by any stretch of the imagination, but we were acquaintances. We knew each other. Well, Jennifer and I did have some actually very good friends who were close to Randall and were, who were very involved in his campaign for mayor. So over the period of the summer, we would see, uh, we would see this, this, these friends posting pictures of going out and campaigning and knocking on doors, and they were at all these rallies. And, and, and then on the night of, uh, of the election, there they were, right in the, in the mix of the, of the big celebration victory rally. And every time I would see those pictures, I would have that, that, that comparison would start to set in. You know, and I, I was missing out. So it was in the midst of that uh, that I finally said enough. I was experiencing untold anxiety by seeing all of this constantly streaming in front of me. So I deleted the Facebook app from my phone. Now I see pictures like that. And you know, from them and from other friends, maybe, maybe once a week when I open up Facebook, but I'm not looking at them 10, 20, or 30 times a day. And now I, I'm actually still great friends with, uh, with that group. In fact, we saw them just a couple of weeks ago. What I found is I'm able to be very good friends with them, but I'm not constantly putting myself in a situation where I'm sliding into that comparison. Now, you may ask, Brandon doesn't, you know, why does seeing pictures in the, the comparison? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. We, it is human nature to compare ourselves to others. To, it is human nature, as Sakara found in her research, to evaluate ourselves by looking at other people. And seeing what they do and what they have, that is just human nature. In fact, I think that's why the Bible talks about do not covet your neighbor's wife. That, that's, a, that's a big command. It's something we've got to work at. The Bible doesn't give a command if, it's, if it comes naturally, right? It's part of our social instincts. But the thing about seeing my friends in person is that I'm seeing the real them. I'm seeing the real them, and not just the sanitized, always happy, always perfect, always beautiful version that they put on Facebook. Because let's face it, mostly that's what we put on Facebook. We put the great things we're doing. We put the great things that we've accomplished. We put the great things our kids have accomplished and, our, uh, and the, the experiences that we're having. That that's what we represent on social media. And no one can stand up to that kind of comparison, which is another way of saying that very few people are that full of themselves. We, you know, no one can see perfect all the time and hold themselves in comparison and feel good about themselves. And so that raises anxiety. My friends are really great, but they're not perfect. And it's easy for me to remember that as long as I'm seeing them in real life and not just the sanitized version of themselves. So if you have FOMO, or let's just call it empty, I highly encourage you to monitor your social media intake. Cut yourself off. If it's one of those things that instinctively you pull out your phone when you're sitting, uh, you know, when you have a spare moment, cut yourself off. If you have to delete it from your phone, because it will make your life so much better not to have that constant stream of perfection in front of you. I'm not saying cut yourself off from your friends, but find ways to engage with real people, uh, real friends, not just those who, uh, who you see in, in images. All right.
Let's talk a little bit about how this tendency to compare ties into our fears around finances. Another interesting thing Sakara noted in her research is that there is a very strong psychological impulse to avoid being placed in the last place. She calls this last place aversion. Anyone like me have last place aversion? Yeah, I don't want to be last, okay? Uh, you can live with wherever you are on the totem pole, she says, so long as you're not at the very bottom. If you can look down and see that there's at least one other person or one other group down beneath you, you feel pretty good about life. You know, not that that should be comforting. The Bible has a lot to say about that, too. Uh, but uh, it is. We, it's human nature to judge other people and to see ourselves on that totem pole. Uh, interesting look, interestingly, though, when we're trying to figure out where we are on the totem pole, we're not using objective measures. And we're not using a very large data set. You know, you're not thinking... Uh, about the, the people in the slums of Calcutta when you're trying to figure out where you are economically on the totem pole. I mean, you're thinking about people that you see, people that you know, people that you engage with on a daily basis. And let's face it, John's Creek, not Calcutta. <laughs> All right? We're in this community on a daily basis engaged with people who are economically speaking, very high on that totem pole. And so you see how easy it is, especially when you add social media into the mix, to have this anxiety when it comes to money and things of value. Constantly, incessantly, we're seeing images of, of amazing vacations and beautiful cars and stylish clothes. And, 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 we, and in our monetized world, we constantly jockey for position by spending and buying and trying to stay at least one step ahead of that lowest guy in our social group. Now, that may very well be where your anxiety is reflected, that you're not keeping up. And, but I suspect, given that you are Christian, that it's probably more around the, the issue of not having enough money. And often that can really be not anxiety, but fear. Because you see how thin the margin is in your own checkbook. That's not just anxiety, that's fear. It's a real and present danger. Um, Adam Hamilton cites research by the financial firm UBS which surveyed over 2,000 investors with a net worth of at least $1 million. More than one third of that survey had net worth in excess of $5 million. So not poor people by any stretch of the imagination. But when UBS asked about how much wealth do you aspire to have, the wealthier the respondent, the higher the goal. Now that's not surprising. People with that kind of net worth aren't typically lazy and setting low expectations for themselves. They're high expectation people, so they're going to aspire to more. But one thing that did surprise me, two-thirds of the respondents said that one major setback, like the loss of a job, a market downturn, would cause major financial pain in their lives. Remember Adam Hamilton's Two steps right here in the middle. Examine your assumptions, attack your anxieties with action. Perhaps the only single subject more prevalent in the New Testament that will talk about the end is to talk about money. Jesus is constantly inviting us to re-examine our, our assumptions around money. Consider the lilies of the field, he says, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably heard that passage and many more about money. You've heard them again and again, but it's really hard to believe those statements and what they say about money when all we see in the real world is that money is everything. Your status is everything. It's hard to, to have those convictions deep in our hearts when all we see is to the contrary. If you truly want to tackle your fear, it's not enough just to examine your assumptions, but we also have to take action, and I often find that's where we really struggle. The best thing we can do in our financial lives to deal with fear and anxiety is to invest in treasures that won't wear out. That's the number one thing we can do. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if we invest in treasures that honor God and not that tick us up, not just to tick us up the totem pole, 
then I think we'll find that our lives will be much less filled with anxiety. And so here's how this works. Here's how you invest in those treasures that aren't God. When you're facing a major purchase, we all have to make major purchases. But when you're facing that, ask yourself, how is this purchase going to honor the Lord even more than it honors me? And if you can do that, then those decisions will start to bend toward Christ and not toward you. The second thing that we can do in our financial lives is to create margin. If you're living paycheck to paycheck at $50,000 income or $50 million income, you're doing it wrong. Your life is going to be a nervous wreck one day after the next because you don't have any margin in your life in that checkbook to weather those things that you know are going to come. That assumption, one of the assumptions that Jesus says is, you know, your life is more than clothing. He also says that, that we can't build bigger barns and take them with us when we die. So that's one of those core assumptions. So we ought to create some margin in our life to give and to share. One of the things that God says to, to Moses, I, will, I mean to Abraham, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. We can't be a blessing if we're worried about our own, own food. We can't feed others if we're worried about feeding ourselves. We're going to be overstressed about our own home, and we can't provide shelter for others. But if we earn $50,000 and live a $40,000 lifestyle, suddenly there's some margin in our lives. So those are two things that can help us attack that anxiety. Create margin and invest in treasure that doesn't work. All right. Time's up today. I want to end with a prayer, and uh, we will go forth and worship our God who is bigger than any of these fears, any of these threats, any of these things that cause us anxiety. As I pray, I want you uh, to say we give thanks to you, O oh Lord. I will say, um, I will say to you, we give thanks to you, O oh Lord. So when I say to you, that's what you say. When the morning is bright with possibility, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When the day is dark and the skies are heavy, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When children remind us of your promises for the future, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When the car makes strange noises on the way to work, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When we receive an unexpected gift, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When the bill is more than we expected and the bank account is low, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When we lose unwanted pounds on the scale, to you, we give thanks, O oh Lord. When weary 